my team regard him as one of one of the home home boys. Um, he's been a huge supporter of this festival since it was since it was started. Um, he's given us encouragement from the de from from the get go. He was here in 2014. He was here in 2016. We were of course delighted to report to him that the results of the first two festivals produced over a quarter of a billion, sorry half a billion pounds of new investment for UK PLC and over 7,000 new jobs. We're also delighted for his continued support that this is in the north of England, in Liverpool. Without further ado, will you please welcome to the stage the Secretary of State, Greg Clark. Well, Max, thanks very much indeed for that introduction. It is fantastic to, uh, to be here for the uh, third time at what is the, uh, the largest business festival anywhere in the world. And, uh, uh, I know the deals being done uh, over lunch there in the, uh, in the lounge uh, is very impressive. I think 20% of the attendees are from uh, different countries uh, around the world. There might be a World Cup going on in, uh, in Russia, but we, uh, we have our own uh, international gathering uh, here that's doing uh, great work. Um, the theme of today uh, is uh, shipping and logistics. Uh, and of course, there's no better place uh, than Liverpool to be discussing uh, those uh, issues. Uh, just over a hundred years ago, uh, a historian, W.T. Pike, wrote, uh, In olden times, it used to be said, all roads lead to Rome. Today, he said, all seas lead to Liverpool. Uh, and indeed, at the start of the 20th century, Liverpool was a titan of the global trade in goods. Uh, this city conducted one-third of the UK's export trade. Uh, it owned one-third of UK shipping, uh, and one-seventh of all registered shipping anywhere in the world was registered here in Liverpool. Now today, Liverpool is retaking its place uh, as a global player uh, in world trade. Uh, in 2016, the completion of Liverpool's £400 million container terminal meant that instead of being able to accommodate just 5% of the world's container vessels, the port can now accept 95% uh, of those vessels. Uh, but despite its strong history in goods, uh, everyone here knows that this is a city and a region that excels in services. Head to almost any country on earth, and examples are right here before your eyes. Just take China. I was, Max says, uh, touring the stands and visited the, the Shanghai uh, stand. Uh, you've got a picture there of Shanghai's historic waterfront. Uh, you'll find three buildings uh, on that waterfront that were modelled on Liverpool's Three Graces, which stand just uh, less than a mile north of here. Across the country, uh, the uh, Chinese citizens are discovering our creative industries, in other words, our services. Uh, the Harry Potter spin-off, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, filmed on the streets of Liverpool. It took more than, three, uh, more than 30 million pounds uh, in China on its opening weekend. And in Beijing, as soon as you step off the plane, you'll enter a terminal designed by the architect Norman Foster, who was born in Stockport, studied at the University of Manchester. We have got a services sector that other countries would kill for. The labels designed in Britain, filmed in Britain, recorded in Britain, uh, are all hallmarks of quality. And our industrial strategy is about growing strengths just like these. So today, uh, in this great international festival, uh, I want to talk about how we can build on our deserved reputation to make the UK the very best in the world. Here in the northwest of England, uh, three million jobs are in the services sector. That's eight out of 10 of all jobs in the region. And when we think about those people who work in services in the UK, often we think of bankers and lawyers and accountants. And they make a big contribution to our national economy uh, and to the economy of the, the north of England. And Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds are just three of the cities uh, for whom professional and financial services have long, in historic times and now, played a big role. But that's not the whole story. The services cover many other sectors that you might not immediately think of. Uh, lots of the people I grow, grew up with from Teesside, for example, uh, have enjoyed good careers, earning good money for themselves, their family and the country, uh, servicing the offshore oil rigs in the North Sea learning a set of skills that they could take with them and use around the world, exporting those services. On top of this, the contribution <coughs> services makes to our manufacturing sector is not always fully appreciated. 
We often think of manufacturing and services as being in different parts of the economy. But more than one third of the value of UK manufacturing exports reflects the value added from the services sector. While half of the jobs in UK manufacturing are actually in services occupations. And in a world of cutting edge, high tech goods, a product and the services needed to keep them running smoothly are often completely inseparable. So in this sense, exporting a product abroad isn't just the, the end of a deal, but it's also the beginning of a relationship. For example, when Rolls-Royce sells an engine, the business value often comes from the long-term in-service support and partnership with the customer, rather than the initial sale itself. So from film to health tech to services roles linked to advanced manufacturing, so many jobs rest on our ability to export beyond our shores. Now, as I said, British services have a deserved reputation for quality that's reached all four corners of the earth. But right now, we need to recognize that the EU is by far and away the single biggest consumer of our services exports. 90 billion pounds of services exports went to the EU in 2016. That's more than uh, to our eight next largest partners put together. United States, Switzerland, Japan, Australia, uh, Canada, China, Singapore, and Norway. And if you needed more proof of our strength in services, uh, of course, we export far more services to the rest of the EU than we import from them, a surplus uh, of over 14 billion pounds in 2016. And this extraordinary performance has been built on the back of established trading relationships, and in particular, the right to be confident uh, in being able to sell services uh, as well as goods as of right. This arrangement has made sure that UK firms are treated in the same way uh, as EU ones. Uh, ensure that others recognise our professional qualifications. It's made it easy to set up a subsidiary in the EU. It's allowed profits to be returned to the UK without restriction and set out rules to make it easy for companies providing services uh, to send workers wherever they're needed. Now over the years we've become used to, to these things, we've taken them for granted. But they don't happen without agreement. So as we leave the European Union, uh, and EU law, law no longer applies here, uh, we must deliberately set out to maintain these rights and to introduce as few new barriers to trade in services as possible. This is every bit as important as avoiding barriers in manufactured goods. So far, however, most of the debate has been about goods, about how our new customs arrangements uh, with the EU should be made to keep borders flowing, and to avoid costly delays and paperwork. Now that's entirely right, but in order to provide services, it's people also who must not be held up. Mobility is to services what customs is to goods. According to the Engineering Employers Federation, three quarters of manufacturers are posting workers, that's to say sending their employees to undertake activities in other EU member states doing everything from attending trade fairs to selling and marketing their products, from undertaking training courses to installing, servicing, and repairing their products. And when I talk to UK companies who offer services, many of them stress the importance of this business mobility. The temporary cross-border service provision which underpins their business as usual, from creatives to engineers to global aerospace firms, every single day, fly in, fly out, day trips, uh, keep the wheels of business turning, uh, some of those stays uh, are more extended. Let me give you just a few examples. This morning uh, I was at uh, Prinovis, a printing company uh, sets up just down the road from here. They regularly send their UK employees uh, to, uh, to Germany to be trained in the use uh, of some of the machines they use. Um, take Keith Cooper, who runs uh, Northlight Images uh, in Leicester, specialist in architectural photography, he works with British firms all over the world, but mainly in Europe. And at the moment, uh, he's able to go and work uh, in Europe, provide his services, uh, and return to the UK without any problems. Same with machine tools, uh, making sure that European markets uh, have no frictions in the ability to provide those services. Uh, uh, take Airbus. Their employees uh, made 18,000 trips to France alone in 2017. Because they need to move employees in such numbers at such high frequency, they operate their own internal shuttle between their site at Broughton, not far from here in North Wales, and their Bristol and Toulouse sites. That's in addition to the commercial flights that they use. 
ferries about 50 employees a day to undertake what is critical work to their business. If we were to include all movements both ways, including commercial flights, then it's about 30,000 trips uh, that take place uh, each year. So I completely understand when companies say that they rely on official mobility as it currently stands, uh, and that they would have concerns if there were any restrictions on people's ability to travel uh, at short notice, because so that would be uh, as damaging to our economy as frictions and disruptions at the borders would be. Now the issue of mobility is an important one. The Prime Minister touched upon it uh, in her Mansion House speech uh, a few months ago, saying that we want to and agree that we want to, I quote, agree an appropriate labour mobility framework that enables UK businesses and self-employed professionals to travel to the EU to provide services to clients in person. So I hear loud and clear five requirements the business has to ensure that our services trade with the EU and the manufacturing that is inextricably linked to it can continue to flourish. The mutual recognition of professional qualifications, the clear right to continue to be able to send people to provide services across Europe, simple intra-company transfers of people, the right to establish operating bases or offices on the same basis as a local firm, and the ability to remit the profits of those activities back to this country. And so let me say clearly that part of the point uh, of uh, festivals such as this to be able to, uh, to meet with businesses, to hear the views of businesses uh, up and down the country and across the world is to make sure that we hear and act on those voices. Uh, I and the Prime Minister and my colleagues uh, in government uh, value the contribution that you make to those uh, discussions uh, because the business view is always, in my experience, uh, one that puts evidence before ideology. You know the reality of employing people and exporting across the world. This festival is a testament uh, to your ability to do that. Uh, and that's something that we need always to listen to. Beyond Brexit, our industrial strategy is helping Britain seize the vast opportunities of new innovations and technologies uh, which can, can transform our economy, whether it's in manufacturing, whether it's in services uh, and other sectors. Uh, on Monday, uh, we launched a, a £12 million pounds next generation services challenge uh, to open for applications uh, to, uh, as part of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, it would invest in projects using AI uh, and data technologies to transform services businesses like uh, accountancy, insurance, and legal services, and many others. And when the next generation of researchers and innovators, innovators uh, look at where to develop their next big idea, we want the UK to be top of the list. And today, uh, we have a very significant uh, investment uh, to announce. We're investing £1.3 billion to grow our research and innovation talent right across the uh, economy and right across the, the country. We know, and everyone here knows, uh, that we succeed uh, when we innovate, that when we invest in the future. Uh, and we need to be the place uh, that not only is a good place to, uh, to make those discoveries, but we need to make sure that the best people from our country and around the world work with each other uh, to make those discoveries, to help create, whether it's the, uh, the new uh, tech uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs of the future, whether it's the, the research pioneers, uh, whether it's the Nobel Prize winners uh, of the future. We need to invest in creating them. So the inaugural Future Leaders program uh, will provide funding for 550 rising stars uh, in the world of innovation and science. These new fellowships awarded over the next three years uh, will have a lifetime value of nearly 900 million pounds. They'll be open to people from all over the world. And on top of this, uh, we're investing 350 million pounds uh, in prestigious National Academy fellowships uh, and including uh, having uh, more PhD studentships in all of the areas of cutting edge technology. This money that we're investing as part of our industrial strategy will help ensure that we raise the level of investment in research and innovation uh, from its current level, about 1.7% of our national income, to 2.4% uh, within 10 years. It'll help us become the world's most innovative economy by 2030. So ladies and gentlemen, I said that uh, in the past, all seas led to Liverpool. And I know that in the future, 
we must make sure that all roads, railways, sea lanes and runways will not only take British goods, but British people to and from Britain as they continue to play a prospering trade in both goods and services. And at this, a festival of business, it's only right that we should celebrate our prowess in goods and services. Across the world and across Europe, customers opt for increasing numbers. Our apps, our film, our health tech, and other services that are pioneered here in the UK, just as the same as they do for our advanced manufacturing products. In the years to come, I know that we will build on this position of strength. This great city of Liverpool stands as a prime example of this, a city founded on trade in physical goods. It's now perhaps even more renowned for its cultural strength, known all over the world, in every city of every continent in the world. The reputation of the city of Liverpool uh, is known for what we export uh, from this place. In other words, in the services uh, that the city trades on. So Liverpool, I think, is a, a good example for the way our country uh, needs to uh, develop. We need to keep looking outwards, keep being open, keep sending British people, British services, as well as British goods, to serve us well in markets across Europe and around the world. Thank you very much indeed for allowing me to come and join you today.